Welcome everyone um, to our session on the Grunwick strike. I am Sundari Anita, Professor of Gender, Violence and Work at the University of Lincoln. Um, today's session is based on research that I conducted with Professor Ruth Pearson from the University of Leeds. So Grunwick strike, many of you may not have heard of it. Some of you might have. Um, the Grunwick strike is famous in some circles um, for for a period when South Asian migrant women stood up to the oppressive conditions that they were facing at work and took strike action. Um, it's also famous in some circles um, for the extent of support that they got from ordinary workers in the UK. We did this research because though in some circles it's famous, in other circles, particularly in the communities um, from which the women were, South Asian communities, we found that there was very little knowledge about the about the strike. And um, among young people, particularly children, there was no knowledge about the strike. We also wanted to do this research because we found around us a dominant construction, a stereotype of South Asian women as passive, as meek. And if you looked at newspapers, if you looked at representations in um, uh, other media, the constructions were of um, women who were confined to the domestic sphere. So what was absent in these constructions were their role as workers and as citizens, as workers who were active in the workplace, who were full members of their working uh, workplace, of the, these communities, and who were um, active in the struggle for workers' rights in the UK. So we felt that there was this erasure, this um, invisibilization of um, this dimension of South Asian women's lives in the UK. And within the trade union movement, um, the Grunwick dispute was celebrated, was well remembered, but we felt that it was misremembered. It was remembered at this turning, as this turning point, at this great moment when the trade unions were um, were recognizing the needs of migrant workers, of women workers, as a moment when issues of race had been resolved by the trade union. And we felt there were lots of um, problems with the way it was forgotten or misremembered, the Grunwick dispute. And we wanted to find out um, more about this dispute and uh, learn lessons from it for how we understand issues of race, of citizenship, of uh, migrant um, uh, people's uh, uh, lives in the UK. And so this session will draw upon uh, some of that research. Um, our focus is on the Grunwick dispute. So the, I think the key um, issue with any uh, event in history is to understand who the participants were um, and to gain an insight into what were the motivations, what, what made them um, change history, as it were. So the majority of the women who took part in the Grunwick dispute were um, of South Asian origin, uh, but um, uh, in the UK, and they were twice migrants or even thrice migrants. So they didn't come to the UK directly from um, India. They From India, they went to countries in East Africa as part of the colonial regime. And um, they occupied the middle layer in those regimes where the white rulers were at the top and the indigenous, the black Africans were at the bottom. And so they were privileged, yeah? Um, and they had resources there. But when those countries became independent, um, and they started trying to claw back rights for their own um, citizens. And um, South Asians there held British citizenship and were often reluctant to give that up and take on the citizenship of those countries in which they had lived for decades. Some of them had been born there. So many of them came to the UK as British passport holders, but they found life very difficult here. This was a very racist country then, as it is now. Um, and they had... Um, as uh, women in um, middle class, in relatively privileged uh, families in Africa, in countries in Africa, they had very little experience of waged work, of working for money outside the home. Some of them might have worked from home as teachers or, or home tutoring, but um, they were definitely not used to factory work. And when they came to the UK, that was the kind of work that was available for migrants. So not having done assembly work, factory work, they were they had no knowledge of trade unions, of organizing, um, of the you know struggle for rights. 
but when they came here, they found that um, they, many of them couldn't bring their resources, their financial resources uh, to the UK. And so they found that they had to work together as entire family units. They came together with their whole family to regain their class status, middle class position. So all of them, all the members of the family who were adults had to go to work and say so they found themselves in the labor market. And um, they joined the Grunwick factory, which produced films. Uh, it was a photo processing factory um, where in those days there were no digital cameras. So people sent off their mm, photographs after holidays. Um, they posted them and the Grunwick factory would process them and send it back to um, uh, holiday makers. Um, gradually, the Grunwick factory changed and they started recruiting uh, the newly arrived migrants um, from countries in East Africa, the South Asians, um, because they were considered good workers. They were considered, and by good workers, we mean workers who will work very hard for very little money. And the assumption was, again, the stereotype that as women, South Asian women, they'll be docile. They won't complain. They will, um, they will not organize. They will not demand better rights. Of course, that didn't play out the way the owners expected. So um, the conditions at Grunwick were particularly oppressive. And this was played upon gender as well as race. So the workers had a list um, that was put up on the board of good workers. And if you weren't working at the pace that was expected, your name would go down that list. And if it was at the bottom of that list, you could be sacked. There were other particularly gendered um, uh, you know, constraints. So the women had to raise their hands if they wanted to go to the loo. And, the, um, and they had to ask loudly um, in front of all the other workers. Um, and the managers were white men. And many of them felt embarrassed to uh, uh, ask to go to the loo. And so they'd complain to um, Jaya Bin Desai, who was one of the older uh, workers there. Um, Others were in their 20s, she was um, or, you know, 18, 19, um, and she was a bit older than them. And they complained that they felt ashamed to ask, and they had to hold on all day. And there were other things. They had to work overtime at very short notice. And for many women, that was very hard, because at the end of the day's work, they had to go home and cook and clean. Women, as we know, do a double shift. And so um, if at 7 o'clock they were told to stay on, it would be very difficult for them because they had work to do when they went home. So what happened um, one day in August 1976, there had been a bit of an altercation that morning at work at the workplace. Um, there were some student workers there because this was summer, August, peak period. Uh, so they were, they were employed there temporarily. And Jabin Desai's son was there. And he and his friends were doing their work on the assembly line, giggling, fooling around as young people do. So the manager turned to them and said, stop chattering like monkeys. This is not a zoo. Jab and Desai was upset when she heard that a reprimand because we all know what the connotations of calling um, black people, Asian people, monkeys is. Yeah, it has a long history, um, uh, you know, from colonial times of um, of this particular construction of non-white people as animals. So the term monkey, um, you know, behaving like animals has a particular very racist connotation. She was upset. Later that day, as she was getting ready to go home, the manager turned to her and said, you've got to, um, we want you to stay back for an overtime till 10 o'clock. She was mindful of the long journey home in the dark and of the second shift she had waiting for her. So she turned to the manager, there were angry words exchanged. Uh, and she said, let me tell you something, Mr. Manager, what you run here is not a factory, it is a zoo. And in a zoo, we have many different types of animals. We have um, monkeys who dance to your tune. We also have lions who can bite your head off. We are the lions, Mr. Manager. And she walked out, she'd had enough. As she left, she turned around and told her co-workers, this man won't treat white workers the way he treats us. They went out, uh, found out how to join the tra a trade union and started organizing. Within a few days, they had several workers who walked out with them and were sacked. Thus began the long dispute. For the first few months, it was very lonely. Um, they had very little support. And then Jabin Desai walked out, uh, uh, went to different factories, different uh, workplaces, 
trying to get the support of other workers. The trade union embraced their cause, the trade union uh, congress, and supported them. And gradually the word spread that there were these group of migrant workers, women workers, who wanted to join the trade union and fight for their rights, and they weren't being allowed to. And so um, the support grew. And um, over the next few months, they had um, they released leaflets, they organized mass pickets. And by the summer, following summer of 77, there were several thousand people turning up on the picket lines. Here are the pictures from those picket lines. This was unimaginable in the UK. And we're talking about a country where just a few years earlier, uh, when workers, when uh, migrant workers, when women workers tried to um, organize strike action um, because they were paid less than white workers, they were paid less than women workers were paid less than male workers, they found very little support from their trade union. So they, um, historically, what had happened was in such strike action, they had to fight not just their employer, they also had to fight their trade union and their co-workers who wouldn't support them. So this is the background against which these images stood out as something that was distinctive. So we had ordinary workers, ordinary students, teachers, people on their way to work joining this picket line. And on some days, we had 20,000 people in support of these workers. So um, for a moment, it seemed that the Grunwick dispute could be won. But um, the uh, owner uh, organized, counter organized with the help of right wing organization called NAF. And um, there was a huge heavy policing of the picket line and um, lots of um, the special patrol group, which is a, a particular um, unit in the police, was deployed on horseback. The picketers were broken up. There was lots of violence. And this was the same unit that was tested in the Grunwick dispute and was later deployed for the minor strike to break up the minor strike. So very heavy handed policing, which occupied the front pages um, of the newspaper. And we know now that it was a misrepresentation. The front pages cast the strikers as aggressive as the problem. And we know now from historical records, and we've scanned those records, that this was all part of a strategy and that uh, the violence by the police was underplayed by the media. And this is a story that happens again and again in terms of thinking through how the media represents migrant workers' struggles, mm, dis uh, you know, um, activism, action mm, uh, on issues of race. Meanwhile, the Labour government had a very wafer-thin majority and they weren't um, happy with the um, uh, coverage that the Grunwick dispute was uh, getting. And so they put pressure on the trade unions to withdraw their support for mass pickets. And the trade unions tried to get um, this issue resolved through the courts, through um, inquiry that was set up, and um, through uh, arbitration through the ACAS, which was an organization which brings together employers and workers. However, that didn't work because the employer was not willing to negotiate. And when the inquiry, this common inquiry, found in the favor of workers, said they should be reinstated, the employer wasn't willing to listen to it. So there was no legal force behind these recommendations. And so the employer could just reject them. What it also tells us is that sometimes bureaucratic measures don't um, serve uh, workers, serve marginalized workers very well. And these workers were therefore more keen to carry on with solidarity action because the strength of those who are underprivileged often lies in collective action. However, um, the trade union eventually withdrew their support for these workers. Um, they tried to re restart the mass pickets in October um, of 77, but um, it didn't, without trade union support, it was very difficult to do that. And eventually, you see that picture on this page, four workers went on hunger strike outside the uh, TUC headquarters in London against their own trade union, asking for their support. So the trade union had stood behind the workers for a period, and that's when the Grunwick dispute seemed um, to make history, but then they withdrew their support. The trade union didn't budge, and eventually, the following, in a few months, um, the workers called off the Grunwick dispute. So you might wonder um, why we're talking about it if it was lost. They didn't really win it, did they? Well, what the Grunwick dispute reminds us is um, challenges that workers face, um, and particularly migrant workers face, 
and have faced in history. And though it was lost, it did, it did succeed in um, mobilizing workers, ordinary workers to support, um, uh, in support of migrant workers. And it reminds us of challenges that we still face, migrant workers still face in the UK today. And in the contemporary times, those challenges are because of globalization, like capital can move across the world, but workers, the mobility of workers is restricted. And we're seeing very similar situation now that we saw during the Grunwick dispute or before the Grunwick dispute, where there's a whole rise of white nationalism and where workers are mobilized um, against other workers on, base, on the basis of racism. So where they, the other workers are cast as threat to their rights, uh, as threat to their wages. And um, in the context of austerity, um, the shrinking welfare state, I think the position of workers, of marginalized categories of workers, workers who are working in the gig economy, who are often migrant workers, women workers, is very precarious in the current period. And today, unlike during the Grunwick dispute, there are a whole range of restrictions which limit the way in which trade unions can act, in which they can mobilize to secure their rights. So today is a period which has many, there are many echoes of what was going on in the 60s and 70s. But it also has a lesson for us in terms of how we might remember the Grunwick dispute. Um, on one hand, we really need to remember how um, the history and the background of the strikers were, was crucial to understanding how they experienced discrimination at work, but also why they felt the need to act against this discrimination, to claim their rights as workers. And their story really tells us, um, challenges the stereotype, the misrepresentation of South Asian women in the UK, um, and, and reminds us that their identity is not just about their domestic role, about their place in the community, it's also as workers. But most crucially, the Grunwick dispute is a really important moment in British history because the white working class saw common cause with migrant and women workers. And just a little story about this, 10 years before the Grunwick dispute, Enoch Powell made the reverse of blood speech. It's a speech that um, in which he argued for an end to immigration and the immigration that he was um, arguing uh, against was the immigration of British passport holders from countries in East Africa. So people like Jabba and Desai, uh, like the workers at Grunwick, who had every right to come to the UK, they were British citizens. But Enoch Powell was arguing for an end to their um, immigration to the UK because they were not white. And he argued the reverse of blood speeches, the streets will be flowing with blood if we don't do this. Um, and at that point, the um, workers, the shop stewards of the Dock Workers Union marched to the parliament demanding an end to immigration. And just a decade after that, the same shop stewards union marched in support of the Grunwick strikers with a banner demanding rights for these workers. So it really tells us the, the debates around Brexit mobilized the white working class by casting the migrant worker as someone who undercuts their wages, who's a threat to their wages and security. And from that, so there are parallels to what happened before the Grunwick dispute, but the fact that it turned around within a short decade and workers could see that they had a common cause, there was a reason for solidarity with each other, is something that's really worthy of celebration and remembering and something to hold on to. I think, and that's why we really need to remember the Grunwick dispute. So a little bit about the resources. So we did this research and we wrote books, uh, articles as academics do, but we felt that mm, that wasn't enough because while we we're doing this research, we realized that even the women who participated in the Grunwick dispute, their own families, their grandchildren didn't know about this. They didn't know about this part of our history. And we, f we felt there was a need to reclaim that history, to remember that history. So we created these um, resources. There's this website here. And um, you can have a look at it. It tells the story of the um, Grunwick and the Gate Gourmet dispute. And we also created this comic, which um, takes the story to a wider audience. So do look at it if you have the chance. And thank you for listening.